Good afternoon, everyone. I ask you to take your seats. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Atlanta Council. It's my pleasure to welcome you today for this event on economic reform in Ukraine and what Kyiv can learn from the Baltic experience. I'd like to offer a special world of welcome to our speakers, to the distinguished guests uh, that I see here today, the ambassadors we have with us as well, and to our audience watching online, especially all of those in Ukraine that follow the Atlantic Council proceedings. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you here, but especially our online audience, to join the conversation using the hashtag ACUkraine on Twitter. So here at the Atlantic Council, we recognize not only the importance of Ukraine, but the implications of the ongoing crisis in Ukraine for Europe's future. Europe's fighting a war on two fronts. Ukraine is fighting a war on two fronts, a military war against Russian aggression in the East and an economic war against corruption in the old ways of doing business. Ukraine's determination to win the economic war is crucial for the country's long-term stability and development. And while the security situation deserves our utmost attention, a spotlight we put quite a bit on here at the Council, we must simultaneously support Ukraine's reform process, the issue we will discuss today. So that's why back at the beginning of 2004, when the crisis began to unfold, the Atlantic Council stood up the Ukraine and Europe Initiative, led by Ambassador John Herbst and our team here. This initiative galvanizes international support for an independent Ukraine within secure borders whose people will determine its own future. <clears throat> In July of that year, the Council published its first roadmap on Ukraine's reform agenda. Um, and today, we've been hearing from the government of President Poroshenko. We've seen its willingness, capacity, and determination to make the necessary hard choices to secure its economic and political future. We had here just last week the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, um, who said on this podium that she's confident that Ukraine, that Kiev is really determined to reform in the wake of the IMF agreement totaling 17 and a half billion. And just yesterday we had at the Atlantic Council the finance minister of Ukraine, Natalie Juresko, um, who laid out, it was clear, a vision, a strategy, and demonstrated that she had the resolve, capability, and credibility to advance a difficult reform agenda in the midst of this crisis. So it's for these reasons that President Poroshenko has established an International Advisory Council for Reforms composed of top-notch international experts, exports, experts to advise on Ukraine's ongoing reform process. So both of our distinguished guests here today, Prime Minister Andres Kubilius, Dr. Anders Osland, uh, have been invited by President Poroshenko to join the International Advisory Council. President Poroshenko has chosen well. As Prime Minister of Lithuania, Mr. Kubilius led his country through the 2008 global financial crisis and the ensuing Euro crisis, restoring stability and economic growth to his country, uh, which has been the most recent entrant into the Eurozone now. Mr. Kubilius's leadership helped usher Lithuania down the path of deeper European integration and sustainable market reforms. It's been a poster child for successful reform in difficult times in Europe's East. Dr. Osland is a preeminent expert on the economic transformation and Ukraine's market reforms, um, the author of a book that's coming out tomorrow, Ukraine, What Went Wrong and How to Fix It. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, a good colleague of ours here at the Atlantic Council as well. And he's long argued that the West should provide broad economic assistance to Ukraine to help transform itself. So we're delighted to have both of you with us today to update on how far Ukrainian forms have come and the challenges lying ahead. Join the Prime Minister and Dr. Osland after they offer some opening remarks will be uh, Miroslava Gongadza, who's with us, a TV anchor and reporter for VO VOA's Ukrainian service. She'll moderate our conversation. Uh, Miroslava, Ms. Gongadza, has won numerous awards for his ac her accomplishment as a journalist, including her reporting on the eve of the 2004 Orange Revolution, and has been a champion for democracy and independent media. Um, she's especially well suited to moderate the conversation today uh, as she's headed off to Ukraine uh, to help facilitate and moderate the International Support Conference for Ukraine. Uh, it's an honor to have you with us as, as well. So without further ado, let me invite the Prime Minister, Mr. Kabilius, to the podium to get us started. Thank you very much. Well, uh, dear colleagues, uh, Mr. Wilson, it's really a big privilege and honor 
to I have a possibility to speak to all of you from the podium of Atlantic Council. Uh, I will try very briefly to say some words from uh, my own experience uh, uh, being in Ukraine quite often uh, during the recent time. And also I will try to uh, speak about uh, uh, my own experience in the Lithuanian reforms. Uh, what uh, David Wilson said, I would add that I was uh, two times uh, Prime Minister of Lithuania, the first time in 1999-2000, second time in, it's from the end of 2008 uh, till 20, 2012. On both occasions I was Prime Minister during uh, quite a deep economical crisis in Lithuania. So uh, that is why perhaps I have some kind of uh, knowledge what to do during the crisis, not so much what to do when the life is uh, beautiful. Uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, visiting Ukraine now, uh, for me it's like going back to what we experienced uh, in, at the very beginning of the 1990s. Uh, sometimes I am joking that in our region real reforms are starting only when Lenin monuments are removed. It's of course very, very symbolic, but... Uh, uh, but it, perhaps it shows that country has enough of political will to get rid of the past. We, we get rid of Lenin monuments back in 1991. Uh, Ukrainians are doing this only, only now. Uh, Georgians did, uh, they removed Stalin monument in 2008. So you can see how, how Lenin monuments, removal of Lenin monuments is connected with, with the reforms which, which are really needed to be done. Second, really, if you look into where Ukraine is now uh, and to compare what kind of reforms they need to do, uh, again, you can see that some of those reforms which they need to do, we did back in 1992, 1993. So really, mm, uh, all the previous governments in Ukraine were maybe speaking about reforms, but were not, not implementing those reforms. Uh, for example, uh, one of the major reforms which the government of Yatsenyuk now is starting to do, removal of energy subsidies, uh, which is very crucial, uh, really, and very important. We need to remember that in Ukraine they are spending something like 7% of GDP for subsidies uh, for the energy prices, which creates a lot of possibility for uh, corruption. So they are, they are doing this reform now. We did it back in 1992-1993. Uh, the third point is really the Ukrainian economy, of course, you know, you know very well, is, is not in a good shape. Uh, all the numbers are showing really quite a deep crisis. Uh, as you know, the forecast for GDP growth uh, uh, for this year is, uh, is, is negative, uh, around of minus 5.5%. Uh, Last year it was minus 6.9%. Uh, the deficit of this year is around perhaps of 13% or 14%. Andres Asland knows much better those numbers. State debt during those years increased uh, from 45% in 2013 up to 90% in 2015. So uh, economical situation really is, 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 is not very good. Uh, and in addition to that, we need to understand uh, or at least to have a very clear picture of what uh, Mr. Putin wants to achieve. Uh, my version of uh, what he wants to achieve is very simple. I think that Putin has a very clear long-term strategy not to allow Ukraine to re reform itself, because successful Ukraine is the biggest danger to, for Putin's kleptocratic regime. So aggression in Eastern Ukraine for Putin is needed not only for occupation of new territories, he is an opportunist. If he is allowed to occupy anything else, he will do it. But the major goal is for uh, is is possibility to create chaos, economical crisis, and dissatisfaction of people in all the Ukraine, in order for Putin to come back with political domination over the whole territory of Ukraine. And of course, uh, we need to uh, we need to understand that uh, he will come back with political domination in a clever way not in a very, very, very 
how to say, mm, very unsophisticated way. I mean, we, we do not, uh, we cannot expect that he will try to bring into political uh, leadership any kind of political party which will declare in a very open way uh, strong uh, sentiments to Russia. What Putin succeeded during this year, he succeeded to create a very pro-European and anti-Russian Ukrainian nation. So he, he will understand this. But his goal to come back with political domination, I think, is one of the, of the most important goals for him. And that is why he is creating all that house. So that is why we in the Western community, we need to have our own long-term strategy how to prevent Putin from the success uh, with his strategy. That is why our assistance to Ukraine is of crucial importance, not only to Ukraine itself, but for the whole Europe and Western world. And uh, it's not only assistance, uh, military assistance uh, for Ukraine to defend its territory, but also assistance with economical reforms. Because in my, in my understanding, uh, such an assistance to Ukraine is, is the only way how, in the longer time perspective, we can uh, positively influence developments in Russia itself. And this is, again, is of crucial importance. Uh, so, as I said before, during several, several months period recently, especially after elections, and when the new government was, was formed, I was quite often visiting Kiev and Ukraine, in some occasions together with Anders Aslund, and, and uh, really, uh, we are trying to advise the government of, of, uh, of Ukraine today on reform agenda using our own, own experience. And from my own experience, being two times a prime minister during, during the deep economical crisis and, and trying to implement all the needed reforms, in Ukraine now they have good conditions for effective implementation of ambitious reform agenda. Uh, a very simple, uh, very simple uh, conclusion from my own experience. In order to make uh, deep reforms, you need to have two major factors in place. One, you need to have a good team for reforms. And uh, I will mention briefly later, I think that they have in Ukraine now such a team. And second factor is you need to have a deep economical crisis. So they have too much of that. Uh, but that creates really very, very strong uh, motivation uh, uh, to move uh, to move forward. About uh, about the team of reforms, I was really very much positively impressed by the new political team back in in Kiev. They are looking like a real post-revolutionary uh, country, very similar how we were looking like uh, uh, back in 1990s. Uh, a lot of young, well-educated professionals in the government, sometimes with too much of nice romantic idealism and lack of uh, political uh, practical uh, uh, experience. But nevertheless, uh, indeed, young professionals uh, from investment banking in the government, at least six or seven of them, uh, out from 20 members of the government, uh, only one does not uh, speak English. So in some way, I started even to envy when I am comparing, uh, you know, Ukrainian government of today and, well, I am in opposition in Lithuania, so I can be quite critical about our government of today. But nevertheless, really, really, uh, team is, is really, is really very good. Of course, shortage of political experience that can become an obstacle uh, for, for implementation, effective implementation of the reforms. But this is quite natural. Again, we need to understand this is a post-revolutionary situation. Young democracy and the political stability is not uh, what you should expect in such a situation. We were changing governments uh, back in 1990s three times a year, and, and that was very, very pretty normal. Of course, Ukraine is in a diff different situation, but we need to, 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 mm, uh, to not to be surprised if we shall see some kind of political instability. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it's very important from political point of view, uh, really, to have not only European type and pro-European political parties in the government, 
but it's very important also to have uh, pro-European political parties in the opposition, which is not the case uh, for time being. So the major obstacle for long-term uh, um, reform process in Ukraine will be next parliamentary elections in, in Ukraine. I don't know when, when, when they will happen. But uh, again, our experience is very simple. In all Central Europe, after revolution, when the first elections were won by revolutionaries themselves, second elections were going in the same way that people were voting against revolutionary governments. And they were voting for somebody who was earlier in power or something like that. So that was how we got uh, former communists uh, back in 1992 into the Lithuanian government. Luckily, during the first several years, because of uh, European uh, uh, left parties' uh, uh, strong, uh, strong uh, advice and support uh, to our former Communist Party, they, they, they became pro-European political party. It's still not the case in Ukraine, and that, is, that can become a major challenge uh, when we are looking into the long-term uh, uh, long-term perspective of, of the reforms. Uh, really, uh, for the time being, uh, I see uh, very clearly the signals that, uh, and, and steps that the government started to make uh, uh, real big reforms. First of all, I mentioned about uh, energy prices. I, I am leaving it to Anders. He, he can explain much, much better. Uh, uh, also, major reforms in the management of state owned enterprises. Uh, my former vice minister, who did such a reform in, in Lithuania, he is now advising uh, Minister of Economy in, in, uh, in Ukraine, Ivar Sabramachus, who is also of Lithuanian origin. So that makes uh, um, be better possibilities to, to implement such a reform. Uh, then we can see really big reforms in energy sector. Uh, when uh, really we, we had a possibility to meet with NAFTA gas leadership again, very modern, very Western orientated uh, young team. And uh, the result of the reforms that uh, is, is, very, is, very, is, very, uh, is very visible, uh, they are starting to diminish uh, in a very effective way uh, dependency on, of Ukraine on, on gas from gas supplies. This is really amazing. Then, of course, we can see uh, steps uh, with the reforms in law enforcement, uh, reforms in police. In June, perhaps, we shall see uh, new police uh, patrols uh, in, in Kiev, reform done by former Vice Minister of Georgia. Very nice lady, very, 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 uh, very clever lady, I would say. I was, again, uh, envying that we do not have such a you uh, know, <laughs> such people to make such reforms. So they are doing really great, great reforms, and 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 and, uh, and uh, we can we can see um, uh, good progress. Of course, here are and here will be a lot of problems with implementation of of reforms. As I said, lack of political experience, shortage of skills in strategic political communication, deficit uh, of traditions of effective cooperation between of government and parliament, lack of clear political party structures inside of the coalition. And a lot of other shortcomings are very well seen, and they can uh, become uh, uh, really uh, big obstacles, big obstacles for implementation of reforms. Uh, that can create a lot of political chaos, which very easily can move into real political instability of the ruling coalition. But again, I would say that we need to be uh, ready for such kind of possible developments, and we uh, and we and we. Mm, uh, uh, need to, not to um, allow to, um, to, 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 to come to some kind of uh, uh, disbelief uh, among ourselves in, in possibilities of Ukraine to make all those reforms. Of course, we need to assist Ukraine in implementing such a big agenda of reforms. And again, from our experience, what, what, uh, what kind of assistance we got when we were going through our reforms from the Western community, I would, I would mention one uh, single ma most important uh, uh, assistance instrument. The promise which we got quite early, in the, in the middle of 1990s, 
that if we shall make all the reforms, we shall be uh, accepted as members of EU and, and, uh, and NATO, that was keeping us on track. Uh, that was, uh, you know, allowing us to move ahead with all the reforms despite all our political uh, mistakes and, 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 and sometimes very stupid decisions. That was, that was really keeping us. So, uh, so what is needed now uh, from Western community in order to assist uh, Ukraine in, in, in similar way. Of course, very clear political statement from EU leadership during forthcoming Riga summit, uh, which will happen at the end of May, that Ukraine uh, has such a membership perspective. As all of you know, in Europe, this is not so easy to achieve. As we understand now, looking back into our history, why Europe gave us such a promise uh, in the middle of 90s, not only that Russia at that time was under Yeltsin uh, leadership, but also because there was a common agreement, transatlantic agreement in between of Washington and, and, and Berlin and Brussels that such kind of uh, development should, should happen. So again, I would, I would like to see uh, also the United States pushing forward the Europeans uh, with such kind of uh, agenda. So, of course, there are a lot of um, other needs which, which are very much needed, like financial assistance or Marshall Plan for Ukraine, which um, uh, still, still is, not, is not becoming a reality. I proposed uh, to reallocate 3% of EU funds uh, to create in such a way 30 billion uh, uh, euros instrument uh, as, as Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Uh, but uh, things are not moving so rapidly as, as we would like to see. But uh, still, I am, I, am, uh, I am hopeful and I am optimist. And I am optimist looking into general uh, developments in our region. It will take time. Uh, we need to uh, reconsider how we understand the whole picture of our region. Uh, uh, as I said, it will take time. In my opinion, Putin will stay in power for the next 20 or 25 years. Uh, not constitutional uh, obstacles he will remove. The only question will, will be his personal health. And being in 60s, he can dream to be in power till, till uh, you know, 80 or 85. So we need to be ready for such uh, developments and he will stay in power. The economy will go down, he will become more aggressive, and the only instrument what the uh, Western community has uh, how to influence uh, in a positive way developments in Russia is an assistance to Ukraine. That is that we need to understand in a very clear way. Uh, when we are talking about Ukraine, we are talking not only about Ukraine. We are talking about uh, all our security of our region, but also we are talking about the future of Russia. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here at uh, the Atlantic Council <clears throat> once again, and in particular to speak after my good friend uh, Andreas Kubilius. We have indeed had very fruitful uh, interaction uh, with uh, Ukraine. I should mention that uh, my book, uh, Ukraine, What Went Wrong and uh, How to Fix It, will be published uh, uh, tomorrow. And um, what I wanted to do now is to go through uh, the brief points about uh, the situation in Ukraine. What went wrong and what uh, needs to be done uh, now. And what went wrong, you can say, I stay, uh, stick here to the economic policy. A, pe a pegged overvalued exchange rate, which caused uh, large current account deficits. Uh, a rising budget deficit, uh, big energy subsidies were the major cause of it, and Yanukovych uh, pursued uh, uh, truly predatory corruption. And this is the sad, sad picture. This is World Bank statistics on um, four of the big uh, countries in the region, uh, where they uh, are in terms of GDP per, uh, per capita, in uh, 1989, uh, 1990, and 2013. 
And the big point here is that Ukraine has become 20% less wealthy in uh, 23 years, while the others have roughly doubled their GDP per capita. Uh, Turkey, Poland, and Russia. I, I don't believe a, a high Russian starting uh, point there, so I would uh, rather cut it down. You always have to take World Bank statistics with um, a pinch of salt. And this is what it looks. You wonder when, why, uh, when did Ukraine do so much worse? And uh, the big answer is the three first years of hyperinflation from 91 to 94 when Russia did considerably better. And the blue line here you see, that's where one should be. This uh, is uh, what Poland uh, did. Uh, high growth after two years of decline, and that's it. While uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia had a wonderful period, 2000 to 2007, but then again after the crisis, uh, global uh, financial crisis, uh, Ukraine has underperformed even Russia, which hasn't done well, while Poland has just floated through uh, quite nicely. So these are the three contrasts. And perhaps the big takeaway here is that Russia doesn't look very good. It's not that much better in uh, institutional terms than Ukraine. It's uh, in the same ballpark. It's mainly oil. That is the, the big difference. And. Uh, <clears throat> Here you have corruption. Here I've contrasted Poland with uh, Ukraine. The red line is Poland. Uh, higher means that you get control over corruption. This is Transparency International's uh, statistic. And you see that Poland has risen all the way, while Ukraine has not necessarily got worse. It is down there. And what has happened is that corruption has rather got concentrated to the top and uh, uh, not get uh, worse uh, overall. Rationalized and concentrated to the top, rather than being uh, a disorganized um, uh, uh, corruption. Uh, and what Poland shows, if I had taken Lithuania, you would have seen a very similar development. Or what the EU really has done is that it has helped control uh, corruption. And this, I think, is a very telling uh, picture. I have uh, on the <coughs> uh, X uh, axis, I have Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. So the further to the right you are, the less corrupt you are. Uh, and on the other axis, I have Freedom House, uh, uh, Civil and Political uh, Freedom. The higher you are, uh, the more democratic you are. So you see two clear groups of countries here. On the one hand, you have all of the 10 East European uh, post-communist countries that have become EU members. Today, they have full democracy and they have corruption under control. Remember that uh, even the countries that are considered most corrupt here, Romania and Bulgaria, are not more corrupt than Italy and Greece, according to Transparency International. And in the other corner, you have uh, most of the post-Soviet uh, countries, uh, the Central Asians uh, and uh, uh, Russia, Belarus, which are thoroughly corrupt and thoroughly authoritarian. Because you know, if you're really corrupt as a ruler, you need to be authoritarian so that you can keep all the profits for yourself. Otherwise, people want to share them and liberalize the economy. And that's, of course, something that must be avoided if you're a corrupt ruler. And the interesting countries are the ones that we have in between that are in neither camp. And this is the Eastern Partnership countries. And among those, Ukraine is the most corrupt, but it's pretty free. Moldova and Georgia are pretty good in both regards. Armenia. It's less corrupt than Ukraine, but uh, it's uh, 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 less, uh, less free also. So the idea is that one should, with the Eastern Partnership, with what Andreas uh, discussed here, try to get these countries up into the right uh, circle, uh, up to, uh, to the right, both democratic and with corruption under control. This is really what should be the aim of the Eastern Partnership. But let me... <clears throat> 
I go back to what went wrong under uh, Yanukovych. And I've already said it. You see current account balance falling below. But I've uh, taken 2014. Thanks to devaluation last year of the current account, the deficit is now under control. International reserves, this has been the real shocker. They fell to only uh, just over $5 billion at the end of February. And what happens then? You get this. So does this work? Yes. Here you see this is uh, end of January. The reserves are too small. The market uh, sees it. And then the Hryvnia collapsed. So during three days in late February, Ukraine was in literally a financial meltdown. When this happened, 23rd uh, to 25th of February, uh, the exchange rate fell by half. What do you do then? You rush to the shops. You buy whatever you can for your money while you still have them. And uh, uh, therefore, the shops all of a sudden became empty as uh, uh, had happened in 1991, uh, in, in the late uh, Soviet period. Uh, fortunately, the IMF program was already agreed and uh, got credibility because people realized that there will be a package going through Parliament so that the IMF program will uh, come into action uh, from the 2nd of March, and then we have seen a stabilization uh, where it uh, should be. But this shows how precarious the situation is and what Andrew uh, talked about, the need for Ukraine to get financial assistance. You can't run uh, an economy with this small reserve. So if I go back to this, I would like to see the reserves up here at 25. And what Yanukovych did was just let it run out. And uh, last year, the government uh, got too little money and did not have a, a, a parliament that would accept economic reform. So <clears throat> what happens to the, to the prices when um, uh, the exchange rate collapses? Well, they skyrocket. Uh, last month, Ukraine had an annualized inflation of 46%. That's no good. Hopefully, this is uh, uh, the top, but that's why it's so important. And uh, also, the budget deficit with NAFTA gas. Uh, here, I have it at 10% for 2014. It has probably... Uh, uh, it's probably a bit more, as uh, Andrews mentioned. And the combination of a big budget deficit and a full exchange rate means that the public debt, as expressed in the GDP per dollar, skyrockets. Ukraine's GDP in dollar terms has fallen from $180 billion to now $80 billion. So this is very little. If you take the Average wage in Ukraine today, it's one-eighth of the Polish level, expressed in dollar terms. So this is a severe poverty issue, and this should be done. And who benefited? Here you have them all. This is the Yanukovych family and the closest uh, uh, collaborators who had all the top uh, government uh, position. So the point I want to emphasize in uh, what went wrong is that Yanukovych had forfeited his mandate. It's true that he won uh, free uh, and fair presidential elections, but only with 49%. But then he abolished the Constitution, had the Constitutional Court, which is supposed to judge by the uh, Constitution, abolishing it instead. And uh, he stole the parliamentary elections in October 2012, easily the worst uh, elections in Ukraine's uh, post-communist history, and embezzled billions from the state. A plausible number is 12, uh, 12 billion uh, dollars. And uh, in the end, he had more than 100 people killed. That's what finished him. That was uh, uh, too much. You can steal, but you can't kill so many people. Then uh, the moderate oligarchs in the parliament uh, turned away from Yanukovych and went over to the other side. 
And here, of course, you have his uh, estate that looks more like uh, Disneyland in miniature than, than, than a palace. And what I want to emphasize about the regime change is that it was as legal as it could be done. It was not the agreement with the EU ministers that was central, but it was that uh, Yanukovych lost uh, support from the moderate uh, oligarchs in his own party so that they turned, uh, uh, turned against him. And instead, we got Peter Poroshenko. So what do we do in this situation? The first thing is to uh, organize uh, on the 25th of May uh, free and fair presidential elections. You need to start from the top. You need to start with the politics. As uh, what Andreas mentioned here, when you get the young people taking over the government, that's when you see that there is a change. And then uh, on the 26th of October, free and fair elections. So often you get now the question, why didn't Ukraine do more reforms last year? Well, because the parliament was against it. The parliament was reasonable when it came to political and national security issues. It was not reasonable when it came to economic reforms because they were against their economic interests. So <clears throat> how do you fix the politics? Uh, this is the point that I think is vital that Andrews uh, emphasized. Use the European Union as a reform anchor. Remember the picture I showed how uh, corruption and freedom is so much greater in the European uh, Union. And political reform essentially means democratization. Then the next step is reform of the state. And uh, what I particularly would emphasize is the need for lustration, the whole scale sacking of top uh, officials. If you don't get rid of them, you can't reform uh, the state. Unfortunately, only 2,000 of them have been sacked. I would much rather have seen all the uh, judges and prosecutors and top military and top uh, police uh, being sacked, then uh, only 2,000. It's too few. And if you have a thoroughly corrupt judiciary, as Ukraine has, then you can't use the judiciary for, uh, uh, for the cleansing. It has to be done by other means, as was the case in, in East Germany after uh, communism. There, one third, uh, of the new judges were um, young East Germans. One third came from West Germany, and one third were re-educated, retrained uh, <coughs> uh, people. And how to fix the economy? The IMF uh, program is vital. A floating exchange rate, fiscal adjustment to cut the budget deficit, uh, energy reform, and uh, uh, social reforms. Uh, of pensions, education, and healthcare. So, uh, what concrete reforms are then needed? Increased gas prices. On the 1st of April, uh, gas prices in Ukraine for the household quadrupled. There was no popular protest uh, at all. And in order to get away with that, you need increased social support, which came, and you need far-reaching regulation. Uh, a floating exchange rate, which is in place, and a law on illustration, a law on state procurement, among other things. This is a long laundry list, and this is being done. Reform is taking place uh, in Ukraine. So which are the big risks? They are quite uh, obvious. The biggest risk is, of course, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, what uh, Andrews uh, elaborated on. The second risk is underfunding. The IMF program does not have enough money in it. And the third is simply that the economic situation is too poor. Uh, for the last two quarters, GDP in annualized terms has fallen by 15%. Then it's difficult to concentrate and get uh, things right. Poverty is a serious problem. And uh, who dares to move in in such a situation? You cannot expect uh, private foreign direct investment uh, this year. Can it be done? Yes, it can, but it's very difficult. Thank you. <clears throat> so
So hello, everyone, uh, one more time. Uh, first, before we start our discussion, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Atlanta Council and its leadership for uh, driving Ukraine's agenda in this town uh, and for your devotion to, uh, to Ukrainian issue and the biggest crisis uh, in Europe, I would say, at this current time. Um, so um, I would like to probably start with my question and then I will open a discussion to, uh, to, to our guest. So um, there are a lot of talks, and actually you mentioned about the need of comprehensive uh, so-called Marshall Plan for Ukraine. So uh, how do you see this plan to be implemented and established? <laughs> Well, uh, if you agree that yeah, it's that yeah. there is a need, it's it's obvious. Uh, I mentioned before. Uh, of course, uh, uh, why such a plan is needed? Again, uh, I would say it's obvious. Uh, financial and economic situation of Ukraine is really, as as you have seen, is really a bad one. Uh, what was the reason for such a situation? Uh, again, Anders Aslan showed very, very clearly the last uh, period of Yanukovych uh, uh, government was one of the major reasons. Of course, uh, besides that, we can say that uh, reforms were not done in Ukraine, then monuments were not removed, and and, <laughs> and we can add uh, all other, you know, uh, things which were not done. But nevertheless, now we cannot blame Ukrainians, only Ukrainians, that they are guilty because they mm, mismanaged so heavily their economy. Uh, there is much mm, bigger question and challenge for all of us. Because again, I, am, I, I would like to say that in Ukraine, uh, there is uh, what is under under uh, under some some kind of uh, challenges? It's not only the future of Ukraine, but also the future of, of our region, the whole region, future of Europe, at, and at the end, future of Russia itself. And the uh, future of Russia should be really big concern of all the Western community, because if we shall not find a proper solution of Russian challenge, Russia as it is now, with Putin staying in power for the next 20 years, we shall have much bigger problems. So, and, uh, uh, and uh, that is why assistance to Ukraine is of a crucial importance, having in mind much more uh, global picture. And in which way we can assist? One is assistance, military assistance, second assistance with the reforms, Promising future future membership, that would be my most most effective instrument how to assist uh, Ukrainian reforms. And last one is economical and financial assistance that it was done, um, uh, you know, with, with Marshall Plan back in in 1940s 1950s. In which way we can do it? I I said in a very simple way. Of course, it would be difficult to ask from uh, uh, from taxpayers. To, re to find uh, new money, but if to look into European uh, uh, possibilities, where Europe has one trillion uh, euros allocated now for so-called structural assistance and 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 multiannual uh, financial budgets till 2020, we are getting in Lithuania 10 billion out out from from all those one trillion money. 10 billion for us is big amount of money. If you look into our budgetary spending, it's around of 25-30% uh, of our budgetary resources, which we are getting from EU. And if we should agree that we can reallocate 3% uh, of what we are getting from EU to assist Ukraine with Marshall Plan, so for us it would mean that we shall get not 10 billion, but 9 billion 700. We should survive, definitely, I know from, from our own experience. So you're cutting your sources yeah, to give yeah, it to Ukraine. Yeah, <laughs> and, and if everybody else in, in, in Europe would agree with such a plan, so we would have 30 billion euros financial instruments to assist, uh, to assist Ukraine. What, would, what should be U.S. involvement 
in this kind of plan if they oh, can be stopped. You ask Kodat another 30 billion. <laughs> <laughs> No, I am I'm not a big expert on, on international financial assistance, but I, I looked from our point of view, how we can assist. But you're a very big expert on going through the crisis, so uh, yeah, you know so, how to do that. So, so of course, uh, again, I would, I would say that there is a need of uh, uh, real money to assist Ukraine. 30 billion can be uh, organized uh, on EU side. How big amount of money can be organized on 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 U.S. side? Uh, I don't know, but uh, Anders knows what well, well, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's another way of uh, doing this, uh, simply through credit. During the financial crisis, uh, Latvia, uh, Hungary, and Romania got credit from the Euro European Union, and for the European Union, this doesn't really cost anything. It's a very small cost uh, to offer. Uh, credits in budgetary terms, and uh, uh, the EU could easily put uh, uh, land uh, 10 billion euros straight away, and then I think that uh, the US that gives uh, uh, these uh, <coughs> credit guarantees now, uh, loan guarantees, they uh, cost very little uh, in the same way because it's uh, just to uh, 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 I don't remember if it's sixty million dollars for uh, for one billion dollars or something like that. Uh, uh, that it co costing budgetary costs. The U.S. Uh, has now given two billion, uh, one this year, uh, 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 one last year, and uh, one uh, uh, is coming this year uh, soon, and another one. I mean, why give two billion dollars? Uh, in, in loan guarantees and five billion dollars instead. So I, I think that it, uh, the U.S. should provide much more uh, funding. It would be reasonable if uh, it provides at half as much as the U.S. Yeah. Um, I would open this to the floor. But one, one thing, one more question. I have very short. Um, uh, George Soros actually advocating for a bigger amount of support package for Ukraine. Uh, do you agree with this position? And um, is there a number big enough? to uh, drive Ukraine from economic crisis? Well, uh, I think that the reforms are in place now. So now you need to finance them. If they are not financed, they can fail. Uh, and the question is if we are discussing 40 or 50 billion uh, dollars for the next two years. That's really the, uh, the issue. And what is needed is, uh, I emphasize here, the reserves. The reserves are now 10 billion dollars. They should be $25 billion. Mm -hmm. And then you have re, uh, uh, loans that are going out that simply need to, uh, to be paid off. And altogether, uh, this is $30 billion on the public side. Do Europeans understand the amount of uh, support needed? Well, uh, uh, it's not so easy to answer. Uh, it looks like uh, there is much better understanding of uh, uh, what uh, what is happening, and again we can uh, uh, be grateful to Mr. Putin that uh, he brought uh, much better understanding in Europe on uh, on what is happening in our region, and we are not feeling any more uh, alone when we were speaking uh, very similar language which what we are speaking now, uh, five years ago, so usually in European capitals we were received uh, with some kind of, uh, how to say, sympathy. Everybody was saying, well, we understand you are still uh, psychologically, you are still uh, in such a bad situation, you are not able to overcome this post-imperial you know, pains and so on. So now it's, it's a little bit easier. But uh, still, I see lack of uh, political will in in uh, in Europe really to move ahead with uh, very clear political strategy uh, how to assist Ukraine in order not to allow uh, President Putin to achieve his long-term strategy goals. And still, it looks like that uh, a prevailing attitude is. Uh, not very good. I mean, uh, let's not do anything what uh, Kremlin will be angry about. Mm -hmm. 
still some kind of appeasement uh, philosophy is prevailing, which is uh, allowing Putin to feel that he is stronger than Europeans. And if he's feeling that he's stronger, then uh, he can do what he will decide uh, uh, is attractive for him. So if the strength will not be shown, both from economical point of view, from military point of view, we shall see next stages of the implementation of his long-term strategy. So it's, there is a proactive policy needed, not sure, reactive. Sure. So um, I would welcome questions from our guests. Please uh, represent yourself and welcome. Uh, George Zajewicz, retired journalist. Uh, those were two very good presentations as to what went wrong, what needs to be done. But uh, this kind of advice Ukraine has heard from the time of independence, some of it has been excellent, some less so, some very general, some more specific, which is a good way to go. But in general, it hasn't worked. It's been uh, pretty much ignored. And I think the overriding factor uh, without which nothing will be done is political will. There's been a lack of political will. My question is to both of the presenters, what needs to be done, how, how to do it to make sure the Ukrainian leadership and also the uh, West, Western leadership gets, finds this political will. I can see it in these kind of terms. They need transplants, transplanted spines, a transplanted brain, a transplanted heart for some of them, and for some of them, a transplant of a pair of, well, uh, I think they have how to do it, how to perform these transplants in these people that have shown complete lack of political will, specifically. Thank, Thank you. you, George. Well, I will try very briefly, again, uh, starting from uh, gratitude to President Putin. He managed during this year to create really a pro-European Ukrainian nation. Uh, and I am, I am real serious. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is to have different meetings in Kiev with government uh, who speaks English and speaks, uh, you know, good political statements about reforms and European agenda, which is really nice, but it's not uh, surprising. But I really was surprised when uh, recently uh, so a few weeks ago, with Martin Center program, EPP program, I went to Dnepropetrovsk, uh, which is, you know, 200 kilometers from, from Donetsk, full hospitals of uh, wounded soldiers. Uh, Kolomoysky was still here, but uh, I, I, I had no, no possibility to meet him. <laughs> uh, but uh, I had a very interesting meeting with uh, people from the Chamber of Commerce, local business people, small ones and then bigger ones, big audience, something like 200 people. And uh, at the end, when, 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 when the meeting was, was over, I was really so positively surprised. Uh, I was feeling like a Hollywood star. Everybody was you know, asking for, to make photos. I, I get rid of all my business cards, you know, because, and really they were speaking about, you know, the dream for Ukraine to become European uh, member, you know, country, how to move ahead, how we made reforms, asking all those, you know, questions, how we moved through. That is real Ukraine. And Dnepropetrovsk is not, you know, I don't know, somebody maybe knows much better, uh, let's say, ethnic uh, situation. It's not totally Ukrainian, can, you know, uh, region. Then exactly yesterday, I got email from some lady from Dnepropetrovsk uh, who, who was organizing that meeting. And she said in, in that letter that she spoke with somebody from Zaporozhye. And in Zaporozhye also, they had Never such meetings with somebody from Europe, you know, especially from, from neighboring Lithuania, which went through all the same, you know, the same very, very similar history. And they said they would like to have me also coming to Zaporozhye. 
I mean, I'm not, uh, not, you know, I'm not speaking about my very high performance qualifications, you know, like Hollywood star. But I'm speaking about local people in Dnepropetrovsk and Zaporozhye who really want to see Ukraine moving, you know, with the reforms and becoming an European country. So there is a source of political will. There is a source of political will. And very strong political will. And I doubt if, if uh, politicians uh, who are now in, in government in Ukraine, that they would be able not to follow such a political will. So uh, I see all the, all the ingredients for Ukraine really to move ahead with all those needed reforms. The question is why they were not able to move earlier. It's an interesting question. But again, we need to be grateful to Mr. Putin that he you know, allowed Ukrainian people to understand very well that they don't want to stay in this you know, post-imperial area, not moving ahead with, with European reforms. So this is what, what, what really uh, made the situation different. And, yeah, what did they, they lack, actually? Then? Yeah, let, let me compare the situation. I, I follow Ukraine closely for the last 30 years, and let me compare with the situation after the Orange Revolution. At that time, there was euphoria. Ukraine had 12% growth in 2004. There was a sense that everything will just continue. We can fool around and discuss uh, reprivatization forever, uh, go after the oligarchs. There was no sense of economic realism uh, at all. Now you have a massive economic crisis and everybody un understands it. Uh, so there was no pressure for uh, economic or structural reforms at that time. Uh, uh, during the Orange Revolution, Ukraine was divided because the Orient Revolution was a Western phenomenon and uh, the East was not part of it. Now you're seeing Ukrainian colors all over, blue and yellow. The Orient Revolution was orange because it was considered controversial to use the Ukrainian uh, colors at, at that uh, time. And indeed, the Russian threat means that the nation is coming together. Uh, civil society was quite respectable at that time, but it's far stronger now. And people are not carried away easily. Then it was uh, Nasha Yulka, it was a very uh, sweet attitude to, towards uh, Yushchenko and uh, Timoshenko. Now the leaders are giving uh, no uh, uh, <clears throat> freedom at all, the people want them really to, uh, to perform. So it's a very strong and positive uh, uh, pressure from, uh, from below. And importantly, the democratic process. Uh, a big mistake after the Orange Revolution was that they did not hold early parliamentary elections. Uh, therefore, they had the old parliament that was not very reformist. And uh, they stayed on until March uh, 2006, and nothing could really be done in legislation uh, then. And then uh, uh, after nine months or eight months, the, orange, the first orange uh, government had collapsed, and it uh, was uh, a disorder ever since. So all these conditions are different. Therefore, we should expect it uh, to be different. And lustration, which uh, uh, all the most successful reform countries have carried out, sacking all the old uh, top cadres is now being done in Ukraine. I would like to see it more radically done, but it is um, being undertaken. Uh, and the reform program is much uh, stronger. Uh, there are many more competent uh, uh, people, and so on. So uh, the things have really changed. What Ukraine needs now is money. The reform will is there. The political majority for reforms uh, is there. Normal reform laws go through with about 275 votes. Thank you. Nadia. Nadia McConnell, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. Uh, this is a question for the Prime Minister. Ukraine has paid a very high price, painful price, for the gift of Putin's unifying Ukraine as a country. What kind of price will your European colleagues need to feel before you find unity in Europe 
to fight this aggression. Besides overflights over Poland, invasion of the Baltics, what will it take? Well, good question. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that is that is exactly what uh, we feel like our 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 responsibility and our major goal to bring uh, to European capitals, Western uh, you know capitals, a very clear understanding of urgency uh, that decisions should be done now not waiting while really the price will become much higher. So this is the question of, uh, of uh, real price, which can cost uh, lives of thousands of people. Uh, as I said uh, you know, earlier, uh, we have no uh, no possibility to believe that uh, Mr. Putin will change its behavior suddenly, you know, into a positive attitude towards Ukraine, towards Europe, towards you know all the global global developments. And if we are taking uh, such a scenario that he will stay in power for the next 20 or 25 years. So uh, appeasement policy, which Europe was trying to live, you know, with, with, uh, during the last uh, at least 15 years with Putin in power, will not work. Putin started uh, to behave in a different way, starting from war in, 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 in Georgia and, and then uh, with a war in Ukraine, showing that such an appeasement he considers, he understands like a weakness. And if he feels weakness on opponent's side, he moves forward. That is his style of behavior. I, you know, <laughs> I'm always telling my personal, uh, personal experience. Uh, I had a possibility to meet him back in 2010 as prime minister with the prime minister. It was an official meeting in Moscow in his Nova Goryeva residence. We spent hour and a half. On some issues, he was quite tough. And I when I went out, I remember very well my, my impression, which I explained to my, my advisors. I said, look, guys, for me, it looked like that I know him very well. He's of my generation. And he looked for me like, I don't know, I see Ambassador, you know, Kate Smith, who, who knows Vilnius very well. In Vilnius, we have a uh, uh, district which, uh, outside of the center, around, uh, around the street, which had the name uh, uh, Red Army, Krasna Army. And we called it uh, Krasnucha, because of Krasna Army, <laughs> Krasnucha, very simple name. <laughs> and and uh, the most uh, Russian-speaking people were living in that district. It's outskirts, you know, of Vilnius. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the guys, young guys, were very tough, you know, in that, in that district. And usually we knew over very well that, you know, if you, if you meet them, to negotiate with them, uh, it's uh, absolutely, you know, no practical uh, results. <laughs> results. I mean, they, they are considering that if you are trying to negotiate, then you are weaker and he moves forward. The only way what, 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 what is working, you, either you beat him back or you call police for your you know, assistance, but usually you are not uh, you know, getting such an assistance, or you run away. And, uh, when, you know, and, and, and my feeling was exactly that he is the guy from that, uh, Putin is guy from that, from that you know, community. And when everybody started to speak about, you know, a hybrid war, something very, very, very complex and very, you know, difficult to understand, I said, look, guys, what we see, it's not a hybrid war. It's a gangster's war. And when the gangsters are behaving exactly what we had an experience from Krasnukha, you know, 
And, uh, and, uh, and the only way what you can do is either you beat them back or you, or, you, or you really showing that you are stronger than they are. If they are feeling that you are weak, they will, they will move forward. Yes, welcome. Alexey Alexeyshvili, uh, former Minister of Finance of Georgia. Um, I will continue uh, in, in that regard and asking you about the uh, uh, Russian uh, information war, informative war. How, how can you address that? I mean, how do you think this propaganda might be um, um, fight it back. I mean, what, what is your opinion about that? Thank you. I don't think it's exactly for questions for us, guests, but you, if you have comments, please. Yeah. Of course, yeah. we, we need to understand, first of all, uh, that Putin is also really uh, making uh, quite effective uh, attempts to win uh, you know, this information war. He started it much earlier than he, he started with his military, you know, efforts. And, uh, and what to do? Again, fight back. What we are doing, we are closing Russian TV channels. This is one thing which wa what we are doing back in Lithuania. Uh, but besides that, of course, we need to fight for, for souls and, and, uh, and minds of our people both Russian speaking and Lithuanian speaking, not to allow, you know, not to allow Putin to be successful with his brainwashing uh, attempts. They are speaking openly, you know, in, in, in Moscow they are speaking openly that they have a goal to appeal to ordinary people in our countries because they have the problem with political elite in our countries, which is too pro-Western orientated. So they are appealing to ordinary people, saying that, Perhaps your political elite made a wrong choice going to the West. And in a very simple, you know, brainwash is, 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 is uh, most effective when it's very simple. Europe, it's a gay Europe, you know, and then things like that. That is <laughs> what, what we see and what we need to fight back. Anders, do you have a comment on that? No. <laughs> okay, then I will collect probably two questions because we are running out of time. Uh, Chris. Please. Uh, Keith Smith from Seafront. I have two questions. One is, uh, Prime Minister mentioned the... Uh, uh, the Prime Minister mentioned the, the, the attraction of the EU and how it could affect reform, just like it did in Lithuania and other countries. What is the forecast for the, in the uh, trade agreement between Ukraine and EU? When is it going to be implemented? And what do you think the long-term effect will be? And the second thing is, What's going on with privatization? Is privatization going to be the same kind of thing in Ukraine that it is basically in Central Europe, that people are afraid of privatization of the big energy firms, of the big, a lot of the big state-owned firms, which will end up, even under a more democratic government, as corrupt as tools, instruments of various political groups, just like they are in Poland and other places today? Uh, my, those are two questions. and. Uh, the last one, I'm sure uh, Anish yes. will know right off the top of his head. Uh, sir, uh, the, the, yeah. Yes. Uh, hello, Georgi Vashadze, a member of Parliament of Georgia, um, founder of Innovation and Development Foundation. We're really actively working in different areas now in Ukraine, and I have several points which I wanted to mention here and questions. Uh, first of all, uh, if you have taken a look on the Ukrainian budget, what for this budget is spent? Usually the money which is the, in the budget, it is just maintenance of the existing system. And uh, there is not, uh, let's say, money which is allocated for the reforms. Uh, so do you think that this is a kind of problem for Ukraine? Uh, second question is um, that um, US and EU has quite many different mechanisms in terms of supporting the reforms in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, my question is, how effective do you think these mechanisms are? Are there some concrete results out of all these projects which are now done in uh, Ukraine? And um, how effectively the money through these different projects are spent? And how effective uh, like results are uh, really on surface? And finally, uh, do you think that there is need uh, for more push from US and EU in terms of reforms to, to Ukraine, but with clear vision 
what to do and how to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yeah, if I start uh, with, uh, with a budget question, uh, Ukraine has very high public expenditure, about 53% of GDP. Uh, so Ukraine spends pretty much a lot on virtually everything that a state can spend on. There are two big expenditures that uh, stood out. 10% of GDP in energy subsidies, which will now be substantially cut to probably 3% of GDP this year, thanks to price liberalizations and other adjustments. And the other is uh, pensions, that uh, two years ago was 18% of GDP. In the US, it's about 5% of GDP, public pensions. And uh, these are pensions that are largely going to the wrong people, the young people who shouldn't have pensions. The lots of early pensions for special categories. Uh, that has been cut now by 4% of GDP to 14% of GDP this year, uh, which um, is a start, but uh, not enough. So the answer is that Ukraine is spending a lot on everything. What is being increased now is defense expenditure from 1.6 to 5.2% of, uh, of uh, GDP. Uh, Ukraine has got a lot of technical assistance all along. Since the wheel has not been there before, it has not been very efficient. What I see and uh, what I think is really important is to get high, highly qualified, high level advisors in at the policy uh, making level and then get young Ukrainians coming in. While what you t traditionally have in for USAID programs, it's uh, not sufficiently qualified middle-aged uh, uh, consultants that are coming in from consulting uh, companies. I don't think that's a very good model. And uh, the TASIS uh, assistance, the EU assistance before, was quite awful. The substantial changes have been done. I dare not say how good it has uh, been done. Often it appears to me that uh, uh, bilateral assistance from small European countries functions better simply because it's given more attention than from, when it, from, from the big uh, organization. On the privatization qu uh, question, there are 3,300 state-owned en enterprises still in Ukraine. The idea is to sell off 2,000 of these, uh, uh, however you can. These are essentially enterprises that have stopped. They are just on the books. Get the assets out so that they uh, function somehow. Think of a small factory that is more or less closed. That's a typical state enterprise in Ukraine. Then you have uh, 60 big enterprises that account for 85% of all production of the state enterprises, including the uh, energy companies. You don't sell anything when the whole economy is on the bottom, because then you will have to sell it very cheaply. And if there are substantial assets, there will always be political problems. So instead, they are find, following the Lithuanian way of improving state uh, enterprise management of the big enterprises uh, first, and then get, um, get it out. You have a substantial problem that is little discussed, and it is military industrial enterprises. There are a couple of hundred of them, still state-owned, essentially working for the Russian military industrial complex. And much of this has now stopped, but 35% of Ukraine's exports in 2013 to Russia was machinery, reed uh, armament. Uh, you, uh, Russia cannot produce one helicopter without uh, Ukrainian helicopter engines. And, and uh, uh, you, uh, the Ukrainian military uh, industry is very important uh, 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 for Russia. So they occupied that territory with all yeah. these factories now. So. Well, well, that's well, one of the ideas yeah. that uh, it's really to unify the military industrial complex, which is in Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, Saporosha, Kiev, and Nikolaev. Well, very briefly, uh, my advice to Ukrainian government was very simple that 
uh, in the reform uh, agenda, they need to make uh, some very clear strategic priorities uh, for good strategic uh, political communication. There are reforms which uh, are long-term reforms, like uh, reforms of uh, legal system and so on, which will take years and years, and you will not be able to show very, very quick results. But there are uh, some very important uh, uh, reform packages which government can do uh, quite quickly and can show results, both painful or, or good results, like uh, removal of energy subsidies, uh, reforms with state-owned enterprises, or reforms with police, which uh, Georgians are very good in advising and, and implementing in, in, in Ukraine. So in, uh, just in order to really to, to show both uh, uh, local people that reforms are, are being implemented, and also in order to show international community that this government is different from uh, previous governments, that they are able to, to move with the reforms. So such kind of skills of strategic, you know, uh, making strategic priorities and, and uh, strategic communication is, is, it would be very, very, very needed for, for the government uh, of, of today. Uh, second, on privatization, I absolutely agree. I just had a possibility to speak with uh, one of, of Lithuanian guys who is, uh, he was our vice minister, now he's leading the group uh, of advisors uh, in the Ministry of Ivar Sobramavichus on state and enterprises. Exactly, this is a strategy. First of all, to to uh, to implement the reforms of the management of those companies, and only then to look into into possibilities to to make privatization. Last point on uh, on calendar uh, free trade agreement and and how things can develop uh, next. It's uh, well. Uh, I hear in Ukraine also very similar uh, worries about free trade agreement what we had back in 1995. Uh, and, and looking uh, now, you know, we remember that we were afraid also of free trade agreement with Europe. But what we were afraid, nobody remembers. And if to look really into, into uh, uh, specific sectors which we were, which we were afraid uh, mostly, for example, agriculture, so out from free trade with, with EU and of membership in EU and assistance from EU, agriculture in Lithuania benefited mostly. So those who were afraid <laughs> uh, mostly of all those developments, they, they benefited in, 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 in the biggest way. So this is what, what uh, free trade is really uh, not a, a, such a dramatic uh, change in, 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 in the life of uh, our region it brings positive developments at the end. And I just want to uh, kind of follow up with this um, in bigger involvement with EU, EU, EU involvement in the forum in Ukraine, as uh, our, one of the, our guests asked. Do we need bigger involvement? And do you think that the advisors, so-called advisors, should not be only advisors, but maybe be in a position to make decisions, bigger decisions for Ukraine? We have some. We have some, too. Well, it, it depends. Uh, I think that uh, what we can, um, I don't know if, if that is possible, but uh, some kind of consolidation of, of the advice uh, should, be, should be really beneficial. I mean that both Ukrainians should look in which areas they want to have an advice, and both all the countries which are trying to advise should also have better, better consolidation of their efforts. And, and, and definitely, I would bring quite a lot of, uh, of those uh, efforts to advise using our experts, not only to Kiev, but also into the regions. Mm -hmm. Kiev is over <laughs> saturated with all so those advisors. We are coming back again to need of Marshall Plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, and last, probably last question, uh, Mr. Levano. Yes. First of all, thank you, Adris and Anders, for very good presentations on this issue. But since we, uh, at least most of us, are very much interested in success of Ukraine, could we move to a little bit harder issues uh, for Ukraine and for Ukrainians? 
In, in the area of economics, one of the issues that has been already raised about the size of the government, about the size of public expenditures, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so far, we have not seen any encouraging statements from the current government team, even, even if it is called reformist one, uh, or from the prime minister, from the president, concerning the desire to reduce substantially size or ability or some kind of any comprehensive plan to do it. If you can share with us some of your discussions with your colleagues in Ukraine about this particular issue. The first one. Second, about this uh, package, uh, financial package, whether it is 30 billion US dollars or 50 and so on. We all know that it is sometimes very important and crucial, but at the same time, the most reforms Lithuania has done without very, with very limited uh, Western support. Estonia, without Western support. Russia, successful reforms of the early year, year 2000s, without Western support. So we know that this uh, substantial financial package uh, could reduce substantial desire to undertake very painful uh, measures. So that is why there is a kind of the play off between money and be between uh, ability to do something. We can also say that, okay, neither Lithuania, Estonia, or uh, certainly Russia was not under threat of in, in external aggression, no doubt. But money, even Western money, cannot buy security cannot buy peace, Something, some other instruments necessary for that. Uh, yeah, so, so just this is a question. Um, so, and also another issue about the, if you can comment on this desire to have a default of the Ukrainian government on some of its debt and all this negotiation that is being underway right now with the creditors. So what is your, both of you, your position about this? Uh, desire to reschedule debt and the, it's going to reduce the uh, body of the debt, interest payments, and so on. And my very special question addressed to you, because you actually raised very substantially a level of discussion by putting this very important issue about Mr. Putin, who so successfully united Ukrainian political nation. Here, just I would ask you to speculate a little bit. Just this would be maybe not a political issue, but just a kind of academic term. If Mr. Putin would not support this process of unification of political nations in Ukraine with its aggression, whether Ukraine would be divided, more or less divided as it was a couple of years ago, politically, and just what would be in this case with, uh, with Ukraine. You mentioned that it's very important element not to have a pro-European government, but also pro-European opposition, which is not the case yet, because uh, opposition is anti-European. Whether Ukraine needs another push from Mr. Putin to have a uh, pro-European opposition? Yeah, sure. No, I understand. That is very same kind of the, could yeah. be cost, uh, but yeah. also kind of just could, could you talk about this? And if let's say there will be no such push uh, at, at, after some time, uh, Ukraine come or political uh, some kind of the leads of Ukraine come back not fully, but maybe slightly back. And again, we would see, not fully, but partially politically divided uh, Ukraine about those issues. Thank you so much. <laughs> Too many questions, if you would be yeah. able to, well, to summarize I, somehow. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, reforms on money. Should we give money uh, uh, to the country which needs to go with the reforms, and uh, if we shall give money, maybe the country will uh, decide not to move with the reform. I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, really Ukraine is in a special, special in, in some way special case. It's not, uh, it's not uh, Lithuania. They have uh, military threats. They have Putin who wants uh, to implement his strategy and to come back with, uh, uh, with, with political domination. Uh, in our case, yes, we used uh, economical crisis to push forward uh, deep reforms. Uh, and we made those reforms, very painful. Uh, the final result was that we lost elections. Okay, I'm very happy to relax in opposition, you know, and. And, 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 and to criticize sometimes our government. Uh, so nothing very bad happened. I mean, we lost, we have 
new government, another government, but it's, uh, you know, things are, are pretty normal. In Ukraine, when this government will lose elections because they will not have enough of financial resources, the question is crucial, who will come to power? Mm -hmm. And that will be totally different from us. It can be different from us. And here is what the history tells us, what Western community did back in, in 1940s, 1950s, both in Italy and Greece, when they saw that there is a, pro, there is a possibility that communists, Stalinists will come to power in those countries. That was the reason why Marshall Plan was implemented, simply to stop political, you know, negative developments in, in all that region. So that is my answer why also Marshall Plan is needed uh, for Ukraine. Uh, then uh, how grateful we need to be to Mr. Putin and what would be if not, if not uh, his uh, biggest mistakes, I, I would say, in, in Ukraine. Well, of course, uh, perhaps scenarios would be in some way maybe not, not uh, not the same as, as, as they were happening uh, you know, during last year. But we, sh we need to remember that uh, before Crimea was uh, occupied, uh, Maidan people uh, decided to, to push uh, Yanukovych out from his uh, position. So what was the reason? Of course, again, we can say that Yanukovych was crazy to agree with Putin not to sign an association agreement. But, you know, it was very clear that uh, the major reason was that Ukrainians at the end, really, they saw this perspective, signing association agreement and going to Europe as their dream. And when somebody started to, to try to remove that dream, they reacted. So it was very clear that people are really, uh, are really moving, moving into that direction. So uh, if not Putin, Putin aggression in Kiev, in, 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 uh, in, in Crimea and the eastern part of Ukraine, well, maybe we would see much more positive development of Ukraine during uh, last year without blood and, and uh, going closer, to, without Yanukovych going closer to Europe. So we, we, we can be grateful to Mr. Putin, but uh, that was a choice of Ukrainian people. And uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, there is, again, I can repeat, there is a need of uh, pro-European opposition. I, I see the tendency that Putin will try to play the games with trying to create some kind of opposition, which will not be so, so pro-European. But, uh, well, this is, uh, how, how in our region democracy is working. I was trying to advise also Saakashvili uh, earlier that he needs to take care about uh, opposition in, in, in Georgia, and that did not happen, and Ivanishvili came, which is a problem, I think. So Ukrainians can face the same problem, but or they can learn from Georgia uh, what is needed to be done. Let me just uh, answer briefly on your uh, public finance question. Uh, it has to be uh, uh, concentrated to a few major posts that one can count, because Ukraine does not have budget systems in place. If you uh, can't try to count when you don't have any budget systems in place, you don't know what you are cutting, and then you will get uh, popular unrest, because people will rightly say it's outrageous to cut here. Uh, 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 because it's such a mess in uh, these uh, uh, systems. So therefore, I'm totally with you that it should be done. Right now, it can't be done. It will take a year at least to establish a reasonable budget system. So in a year, we should revisit uh, 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 this discussion. Thank you so much, and I think uh, maybe we could call Kabilius plan or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We are running away.